IoT, powering the digital economy. Brought to you by Schneider Electric. Digital innovation, internet communication and advances in technology. That's what's powering the digital economy. But the global web of economic interconnections between companies are growing bigger and more complex by the day. So how does the financial sector navigate the complicated world of the internet of things? Today, the world's finances are managed almost entirely online. Sending money is almost instantaneous and the cost of sending that money is tumbling. With such large amounts of capital whizzing around the world, the stakes are high. So in this program, we're focusing on how the big players in the world of finance are adapting to the digital revolution. And what about the financial organizations born in the digital age? What risks are they prepared to take to stay ahead with only the World Wide Web as their shop front? I'll also be talking to the gatekeepers, the regulators who keep the big boys in check, and find out what the future holds for business finance. Financial technology, or fintech, is nothing new, but new regulation and the rise in mobile technology has caused major disruption in the finance sector. One of the banks that's been disrupted is HSBC. It's been around since 1865 and now has branches all over the world with its head office here in the UK. Niall Cameron is the global head of corporate and institutional digital within HSBC's global banking business. Before joining HSBC, Niall was at The Market Group, a global financial information services company. You've got a very interesting background. You started off in banking, then you went into the technology world, then you came back to banking. When you did, mm. you were armed with those tech skills. Was banking ready for it in 2010? Not quite. Um, I think that um, you know, technology has been in banking for a long time, and actually it's probably one of the more technologically advanced industries. But the technology was in a different part of the bank. It was typically in the markets division. It was around the trading systems around the risk systems, some of the payment systems, but it wasn't endemic. There was still a lot of non-technology and non-technology areas in the bank. The fintech sector is you know, relatively new in, it, in its ascendancy. And I think it's woken everybody up. I think people are saying, wow, there's a, there's a, there's a group of companies out there that if we're, you know, if we're not careful, we'll take our business away from us. But if we are thoughtful and collaborative, we can actually work with them and uh, create fantastic uh, new sets of businesses or better businesses with them. Business expectations are now catching up with, with, with personal expectations in terms of the technology we use and in terms of what we want uh, for, for, from our banks. I think, I think people in their personal lives have very high standards of digital expectations. I mean, they, they're used now to really good digital experiences, whether it's you know, shopping or their phone, um, through their media, they, they're used to that. That's only really started to change in the corporate world where people are saying, well, hold a second, if I can have that in my personal life, why can't I have that in my corporate life? Why can't I have that same user experience I'm getting personally when I go to work? So we're, we're, you, we're, we're learning from, um, from the personal digital world and trying to bring that into the corporate world. I think of HSBC as historically being a trade bank, which, which to me feels like lots and lots of paperwork. Yeah. So how yeah. has um, digital innovation changed that and, and how does that tap into what kind of businesses are using your new services? Yeah, I think on, on the, a lot of businesses are, have been heavy in paperwork and digitizing does help that. I mean we work with one of the companies uh, called TradeShift that works very um, seriously on the supply chain in, in trade finance. They allow um, the customers to manage, manage the invoices, documentation, um, find suppliers, um, issue purchase orders, a whole series of, of activities from a trade perspective. They, they do that for the customers. And what, what it allows us to do though is we can connect to those customers um, and connect our financing and our payments products to them as well. So it's a sort of win-win for everybody who goes onto the platform. 
So at HSBC, it's a combination of building things in-house, but also collaborating with outside partners. Completely. We, we look at it first from the customer perspective. What do they want? What can we provide them? What are the things that we could deliver in this new digital age to them? And then we, then we think, OK, how do we build it? Do we do it ourselves? Do we do it externally? Do we, do, it, do we hire people externally? Or do we collaborate with existing firms that may be specialists in that area? And I think the tendency now is to probably do much more outside, but you still need to have very good technologies inside your building to help you with this digital revolution. So is it all about going mobile? Is it all about real-time payments? Is it all about the app? I think it's about getting um, the product and the service to the customer in the way the customer wants it. The customer chooses the way they're going to consume their product and their service, and we have to be there to, to get it to them. Traditional finance businesses like HSBC are making big changes to how they work. But what about their competitors, those businesses that operate entirely online? The London Borough of Richmond-upon-Thames is home to PayPal UK, headed by Managing Director Mark Brandt. He's been in the job since 2008. Before that, he headed the UK sales division of American Express. Formed in 1998 in the digital melting pot of Silicon Valley, PayPal was fintech reliant from the start, developed to solve the problem of how to pay for things bought in the online marketplace. They now have a banking arm and offer point of sale technology to merchants. But you can imagine this could be on the side of the street, the flower seller could have their mobile phone paired by Bluetooth to the PayPal here device. So if you'd like to, like to buy yourself some flowers. At the heart of the PayPal business model is about making it easier for people to pay or be paid. So over the years we've developed a very big network of consumers and businesses that interact with each other with limited friction across our network. Do you see yourselves as a disruptor? Because you were the original disruptor, but now you could arguably be seen as one of the established financial services. I think it's not really established. There's still plenty of, plenty of runway and we're continually looking for new opportunities in the market. And we, we look for clear gaps in the market for both our consumers and our, our business customers. We identify where there's a real need that's being unmet by the traditional players. And I think a great example where we've done that recently is with Paper Working Capital, which is our small business cash advance service. And we're able to provide cash advances to small businesses to enable them to invest in more stock or more hardware or a new facility to enable them to scale their business. And a, a great example that, that comes to mind is a company called Sensory Smart, which started out as a, as a, a lady whose son suffers from autism and needed to, uh, needed to buy special socks without any seams. She realized there were other people that had similar, similar issues, so she'd buy you know, 10 or 20 pairs at a time. So she was able to, using PayPal, very quickly set up a, a business which ran, ran alongside her eBay business. As that business started to scale, all of her payments were going through PayPal. We could see that her business was, was doing well, uh, and we were able to offer a, a cash advance. Um, she took a, a very s relatively small cash advance from us, and she pays that cash advance back as a percentage of each transaction. So if her sales increase dramatically, she pays the advance back quicker. If there's a seasonal lull, then it will take, take longer. She took that advance, and she invested in a shed for the end of her garden because her business, which had started in a, in a spare bedroom, had now outgrown her, her house. So she has, I think she calls it the shed quarters at the bottom of the garden. And it's, it's just a brilliant story because you see the difference that advance made to her. And in the traditional lending world, that would involve lots and lots of paperwork. And her business isn't a traditional business. So the traditional lenders do struggle to, to understand the way those businesses operate. Because we were seeing all of her payments coming through, we were able to, in a matter of seconds, allow her to yeah, enter a few bits of information, and we were able to make that advance available to her. So literally within minutes, she was able to then go, OK, now I can purchase the shed quarters. What's been a game changer in terms of the technology and the digital innovation that you've seen and used at, at PayPal? I think the, the biggest game changer has to be the mobile device. The, the power of it, the type of screen, um, that has meant that we've continued to evolve our consumer and business experiences to enable to take advantage of what the mobile device can now offer. You know, the addition of Bluetooth to a mobile device meant that we could start to develop the PayPal Here card reader, 
which enables small businesses to take payments. So now if you're a taxi driver, you can take PayPal here um, and use that in cap. And in the retail sector, I think we're seeing a big shift from retailers having to invest quite a large amount in static pieces of point of sale equipment to be able to free their, their customer service staff to actually roam the shop floor with a tablet, with a, a mobile card reader device such as PayPal here attached to it, connected via Bluetooth, um, which enables them to then serve the customer wherever they are. And that's really important. That's the heart of what we do is about driving additional business for our merchants. There's no question the world of finance is undergoing some of the biggest changes to the way it operates in its history. And it's embracing those changes enthusiastically. So what are the pitfalls? After the break, I'll be finding out what risks the Internet of Things poses to the banking industry and how it plans to tackle them. London is currently the European capital of finance, competing with New York City for status as the world's major financial hub. It's so important that the European Banking Authority has made London its headquarters. Dirk Halbrich is Head of Consumer Protection, Financial Innovation and Payments at the EBA. They're ahead of the game when it comes to fintech, spearheading the Payment Services Directive 2, or PSD2, which is about to be fully implemented across the European Union. This will effectively break down the big bank's monopoly on user data. What's business going to get out of PSD2? Well, it depends a little bit on who you mean or who you refer to when you say businesses. There, on the one hand, there are the market incumbents, uh, primarily the banks that uh, for a long time had a monopoly over, over the provision of payment services. And then there are the new market challengers that will be entering the market as a result of PSD2 because they're going to be authorized for the first time and they're going to be uh, registered for the first time. Many of these entities are very small. They may not even know of the existence of the EBA. Uh, they may have never interacted with a regulator before, but their views are very important to us because the PSD2 has mandated the EBA with the development of 12 what are called technical standards and guidelines in support of the directive. And a very crucial one uh, of, these, of these mandates were, were the technical standards on security-related aspects such as strong custom authentication, um, which is how customers have to authenticate themselves uh, towards these new providers. Uh, so we are very keen to get the views of those uh, fintech entities and uh, we'll monitor closely whether we got the, uh, the balance right uh, in, in the months to come and if we need to make amendments to our requirements then we will do so. PayPal is one of those fintechs. It values its relationship with the regulators such as the EBA whilst also maintaining its global business. We actively work with the regulators to make sure that we're developing products with them. The regulators are actually great partners of ours. They love to be educated on consumer needs and business needs, um, and we work with them to evolve their, their thinking around regulatory policy. So you say that the regulators need to be educated. Is that another way of saying that you like them to, to, to do things your way? No, the, the regulators like to be educated. They actively approach us to help us help them understand the technology that's evolving in the markets, the, the demands of small businesses, um, because we can help them. Because we've got so many millions of small business relationships around the world, we get real frontline and first line insights from those merchants and we're able to feed that back into the regulator to help evolve their policy and make sure they're striking the right balance between enabling business and protecting businesses and consumers. PSD2 poses bigger challenges for the established banks. They have to give their data away. But HSBC's Nal Cameron sees the bigger picture. I think it's a great opportunity. I think there's a, uh, we're going to have a lot more obviously openness of data, there's going to be more data available. Um, I think it could create a lot of entrepreneurship. Um, I can see some new business models, um, some new customer service models being created for, um, for the consumers. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's a great opportunity. Obviously there are some security concerns um, and people are very you know, concerned that, that the, the data, whilst it gets open, doesn't create any weaknesses in the, in the security system. Um, and that's obviously something that we, we need to be particularly mindful of and particularly careful of. But I think, I think as we, uh, if we go into the future and look back, we'll be pleased that there's this openness of data starts to, to come out and help the, uh, the market develop. 
We've talked a lot about the opportunities that PST2 offers, particularly in Europe, where, where, it, where it's, it's covered. Are there any limitations in terms of the continuity of service that you can offer businesses? To operate as a, as a fintech at scale, you have to be able to operate in multiple markets and provide a consistent service. And for consumer experiences to be adopted at scale, you have to have, to have that consistent experience. So if PSD2 does start to change the experiences we can offer to our consumers and our merchants in a negative way, so it, it takes away some of the convenience, um, then that makes it more difficult. Um, so, for example, if you are Airbnb or Uber and you are oper operating great services on a global level, if you have to change your experience for a UK consumer or a French consumer versus what you operate for the US consumer, that does add complexity. Um, so we have to think carefully about, about that because that could be a challenge. It's not an insurmountable challenge, but it does make it more difficult to operate businesses on a global scale. One area of concern for the finance sector is security. The challenge for the banks is to ensure their systems are robust enough to withstand a cyber assault. You speak to businesses um, every day. I in terms of, of security, how much of a priority is that? Is it's, a, it's a huge priority. And I think it's a huge priority for, for them. It's a huge priority for us. Um, that this data uh, needs to be preserved and protected. And so it, it's a huge issue for us. And, Everything we do and build will always have that sort of very firmly in the plan to make sure that we're not weakening our, our, our defences. The responsibility uh, for a business to protect its transactions lies with the business, not a regulator. So we don't take that uh, responsibility or that job away from a business. It is the responsibility of the business. What we do is we set requirements, regulatory frameworks, in order to help businesses to do that. We have one technical standard and three sets of guidelines that we have developed under the PSD2 in order to make this happen. So a technical standard on strong customer authentication. We've developed also guidelines on what's ca called operational and security risks. Uh, we've also developed guidelines on the reporting of security incidents, of major security incidents, uh, as well as the uh, reporting of payment fraud. So all of this will be generating information and data for us, for the national authorities, as well as for the EBA, so that we can take much more immediate action if we see uh, something from happening. Keeping the world's businesses on the right side of complex regulation will be one of the biggest challenges facing the financial sector in years to come. But could there be bigger challenges? We'll find out after the break. Investment in new technology is what powers the digital economy, even more so in the world of finance. But what are the implications of this new technology for society as a whole? We used to drool over tablets and smartphones. Now they're streamlining how we live our lives. We still haven't seen the full extent of the power of the mobile device in our hands. Um, so we're continuing to watch that and see how we can push the boundaries with using mobile devices and technology to take the friction out of everyday, everyday services and products. Um, so mobile is clearly an area that we spend a lot of time focused on. In the offline world, I think we'll see less and less hardware in stores, and that will change the way the retail environment is. What are you most excited about in terms of the technology that you're developing at, at PayPal now? What, what's going to be the, 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 the next step, the next thing that everyone's talking about, the, the buzz in fintech? One of the most exciting ones is contextual commerce. Um, the way that you discover an item is changing. Um, you aren't necessarily going straight to a website, you're, you're browsing you know, effectively online content. Um, being able to make that purchase in context, whether it's on the Facebook platform or the Pinterest platform, that is particularly exciting because that's changing the consumer journey. So let's flip that around because obviously that's very consumer focused I I in terms of your, who you're thinking about. How does contextual payments fit in to how you work with merchants? I think at the heart of everything we do, we look at the consumer experience. That consumer experience adds value to the merchant. And if we're not adding value to the merchant, then we can't, you know, we can't monetize the service. Whether you're a large merchant or a small merchant, it's another channel through which you reach the consumer. So you go back 20 years ago to when commerce on the internet first started, you, you had your physical world shop, and then you opened a website. Then mobile devices evolved. You then had to think about, okay, how does my website look on a mobile device? Um, and so we're working with merchants both in the physical world 
from a desktop perspective, from a mobile perspective, and now in a contextual commerce channel perspective, to enable those businesses, both large and small, to get access to the consumer through whichever channel the consumer wants to interact with them. The consumer, it appears, is king, and business is focused on giving consumers what they want and quickly. To achieve that, the finance companies will need to innovate to maintain their bottom line. Let's talk about the impacts of emerging technologies. Well, what are you particularly excited about that you might think is going to be the technology of the future that's going to change your business here? Okay, I'm going to cheat on the answer a little bit because I think um, the thing I'm most excited about actually is the cost of technology. It, the, the cost has come down so much. You can do so much. You can, you can be so creative now with technology and data. And you can really create things that only before you, you would have imagined. So that's actually the thing that excites him the most. Um, in terms of new technologies, I think that data is going to become uh, sort of one of the, the new battlegrounds in the future. And uh, so anything, anything t technologically around data, I think, is, is very interesting, um, particularly AI and, um, and all the, sort of the data science technologies. Um, are going to be very, very interesting because because in the in the future that's that's how people compete. They'll compete by using the data that they can access to understand their customer better and more deeply, and and work from that to create customer propositions. So it's all about the data. A one new technology aims to make good use of it. It's called blockchain, an online ledger which offers secure cloud-based storage of data. How do you envisage blockchain streamlining HSBC's business with, with, with uh, companies all over the world? Okay, well, let's say there's a South Korean company. They manufacture televisions. They want to sell them in the States. They've got to get those televisions to the States. And they go through various port authorities. There's different documentation. There's different legislations that have to pass. It, there's a, an incredible number of steps just to get that TV from South Korea to the US. And, and at the moment, this is principally a paper-based system, um, and it's very difficult for people in the supply chain to know where the goods are at any point in time, and what's happening. If you have um, DLT or blockchain that can basically hold all this information for all the participants involved in that transaction, this could end up being incredibly efficient from a cost perspective, but also give a lot of comfort to participants that they know where, what's going on and where that TV is. We've looked at blockchain in one uh, particular case, in one particular use case, which was virtual currencies. Four years ago, we had a rather negative view uh, at that time, but there are lots of other use cases that have been emerging since then, like uh, trade finance and uh, clearing, uh, clearing of payments. Uh, this is quite interesting, and uh, many of the risks that we've identified at the time for virtual currencies probably don't arise uh, for those use cases, but we need to have a closer look, which we haven't done yet. And blockchain will continue to, continue to evolve, um, but for it to become widely used, there needs to, need to be scale use cases on either the consumer side or the merchant side or both, um, and we'll continue to, to follow that and experiment with it and keep abreast of it and continue to look to see whether there is a gap, a clear gap in the market that we can exploit with it. The last and most important piece of the puzzle is security. Biometrics are increasingly playing a role, but how secure is the technology? I, I think there's different types of biometrics, and um, people have, you know, there's voice, there's voice biometrics, there's fingerprint biometrics, iris biometrics, and I think there's going to be many more invented. This is probably one of the areas that's probably one of the most important sort of areas of new technology that the industry needs. And what you'll see is multi-factored um, biometrics, so where you have a number of things that need to be passed by the customer before they're authorized to transact or access a system. We look at things such as biometrics, we look at the way devices that consumers are interacting with are evolving, look at the different hardware factors that they, the opportunities that they offer for us. So we're continually looking at them and constantly evaluating them to strike that balance between convenience for the customer and security for the customer, because both are equally important. More and more new financial technology is being used to verify we are who we say we are online, and that's an important tool for businesses. It's streamlining the way we pay for things, and that's the kind of innovation the regulators would like to see more of. 
So collaboration between the regulators and business could secure the future of the digital economy for decades to come. IOT, powering the digital economy. Brought to you by Schneider Electric.